Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. And one of the major chemical and analytical chem chemistry conferences. I'm a materials chemist by training, but I'm doing so many different things. And I actually added two words to, to my title. Uh, it's not only venturing into analytical chemistry using photonic crystals, but it's actually using bioinspiration. And you will see throughout my talk how interesting biological strategies can be used to optimize uh, existing materials or actually coming up with new strategies. Altogether, if um, I were to look at um, a type of research that I do in, in my lab, it's a very big lab, but almost every time we start with studying of interesting biological materials. I will go back to a number of them that are relevant to my talk today. Then we use it as a biomimetic approach to interesting different materials, but materials that may take a couple of lessons from biological systems. And in particular, we're very much interested in thinking about multifunctional hierarchical materials that have the ability to, uh, to perform multiple function and actually do it in dynamic environment responsive way. Let's get uh, to the topic of uh, my today's talk, and let's give a very short presentation on what is photonic crystals, and in particular, showing various biological uh, creatures that use different types of photonic crystals. So photonic crystals is really those that have diffraction in one, two, and three dimensions. Now, uh, there is 1D photonic crystals, 2D photonic crystals, there's a beautiful creatures each representing these, and 3D photonic structures. I'll show you more interesting examples as we go through the lecture. So what is so special about photonic crystals? Or in particular, photonic crystals that would give rise to structural color. This is the structural color that is used by many biological organisms to present an excellent, vivid, and iridescent color. If I were to compare structural color to a regular chemical color, or in other words, to the pigment, if we think about the underlying mechanism, in structural color, light interacts with microscopic structures. It's a structural color. Pretty much doesn't depend on which material you use for making the structures have color. At the same time, pigments would have molecules that absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect or transmit others. Now, fading is a very interesting feature where structural color certainly has a huge advantage because photobleaching that always occurs in pigments doesn't exist in structural color. It lasts forever or until you break the structure that is responsible for, for the uh, features that give you specific wavelengths of light uh, with which light interacts with the object. Angle dependence. Um, pigments are never angle dependent, but the beauty of structural color that gives you shine, it gives you iridescence, and uh, this angle dependent features are very important, certainly for biological systems. Now, if you grind down material, color remains if it's a pigment, and unfortunately, it's pretty much the only disadvantage of structural color because you grind it and the, and the color is lost. So today, I will try to talk about how photonic crystal-enabled analytical chemistry can be focused on two topics. Um, I will talk probably mostly, we'll see how it goes, about uh, uh, an approach that we call WIC, uh, which is wetting in color kit, and also dynamic order detection by sniffing. So, another example of natural structural color is, of course, very well known example is opals. If we think about opals, these are actually the structures that are composed of SI or two spheres with very specific size range, about 150 to 300 nanometers, 
they're packed in hexagonal or a cubic close packed manner. And depending on the type of packing and also size of these particles, you will have this uh, 3D photonic crystals. And this is a natural 3D photonic crystals as many things in nature done by self-assembly, not by top-down manufacturing the, make, the way we are actually making 3D photonic crystals. So these beautiful iridescent colors and differences between them is just a, a function of how tightly packed these spheres, what is the distance between them, whether it's hexagonal, cubic, and what is okay. So this is opals. Another interesting example, but this is biological example, where the structure is very similar to opals. It's not inorganic, it's organic. But if we look at this butterfly, it's called Paritis sesostris butterfly, black is a pigment, but this beautiful green patch is structural color. So if you look how this patch, where does it get the green color? It gets from that structure. Each block here is a single photonic crystal, but the structure is inverse of opals. Inverse in a sense that where in opals you have spheres with air surrounding them, here, instead of spheres, you will have empty spaces, and surrounding it, is organic matter. So this is the same 3D photonic crystals, but inverted type of it. Why it is so interesting? Because it produces a highly ordered, highly interconnected, porous network that I hope I can use for many different things. So what if we now want to take this strategy of biological strategy of using self-assembly to create these inverse opal structures. So the way one can do it, and very common strategies that have been around for a very long time, is colloidal self-assembly. The idea there is that you will have colloidal spheres. You can choose them in any size range you want if color is of importance to you, and it is to me for the things that I will present next. You should take the colloidal spheres in the range of maybe between 200 nanometers up to 600 nanometers, and this size range will determine the interaction with light and therefore the color that will um, result. Now, if you take these colloidal spheres that could be um, really made of material that you can get rid of if you need, in the solvent, Evaporation of this solid will drive these spheres to self-assemble into generally cubic close um, packed structures. There are other types of assemblies are possible as a function of this solvent evaporation self-assembly mechanism. Now, um, now it's more than 10 years ago, one of my postdocs, maybe because he was lazy, maybe he was just genius, but I hope it's both. Um, if I use this approach to make inverse opals, then I have three-step self-assembly mechanism. First, you assemble them upon evaporation of the solvent. Then, the structures that are formed, you need to infiltrate with the material that will form your in, um, inverse opal structure. And the third one would be to burn away or get rid of these um, colloidal structures that you use as templating objects. What if now we do the same um, self-assembly approach, but instead of solvent that evaporates, we will actually use uh, sol gel precursors to the future phase that you want to make. So the outcome of that is that as it self-assembles, it, it creates a composite film structure. Let's say this would be a tear solution, I want to make structure very similar to, um, to opals, so I want it made of glass, I want to, uh, to make them out of SiO2, then the entire process becomes a two-step process. You self-assemble, you already have 
you don't need to infiltrate anymore, and then you can get rid of these spheres. Just to give you an idea how much better this approach is, not only it's faster, but also if I make films, this is a large area film, this is a smaller area. I was specifically looking for the place that has a defect because you make features that have pretty much no defects throughout up to centimeter or larger scale uh, substrates. Just to uh, get the comparison, if I were to use just regular colloidal assembly and I make a direct opal structure, it's all cracked. It has to crack because as evaporation takes place, you create tensile stress in your system and of course that causes cracking. It packs nicely, but your film would be highly cracked. If now you want to make inverse opal structure, you need to infiltrate it with the carrier material that will become your inverse opal structure. Infiltration into already cracked structure gives you even more cracks because now a sol gel solution will not only penetrate non-uniformly and forming this top layer of the material, but its own um, evaporation will change its, its uh, volume and therefore additional cracking will take place. At the same exact uh, length scale, I'm showing uh, the, the scale bars are the same on the top row and the bottom row. These are the ones that were uh, assembled by this co-assembly mechanism that I just mentioned. So the outcome of that is they can be used as highly uniform, highly regular materials that I don't have time to explain it in detail, but also with precisely controlled crystallographic orientation that can be used for many things. First of all, we can use it for optical um, applications, really as a nice structural color, as nice pigments, um, structural pigments. We use them, and I'm not going to go through that till, at all in this lecture, but I will probably do it in the ACS meeting. We use it as a really highly modular approach to design of catalyst, where you can control so many things you can control molecular scale, but changing surface properties of these inverse uh, opal structures. You can control nanoscale by using a specific particle sizes as you assemble or co-assemble your system. You can have really whole range of um, coatings on conductive substrates. You can change shape of these materials. So it's a really incredible approach uh, that can be used for as I said, for catalysis. We can also have fun with them. We were using them for art and for sports and for education. And my students really love to use this approach to create at the small scale pretty much any picture you want and structure that may have colors that may change, have ang angular, um, s angular iridescent. But let's get to property going beyond simply color and simply beyond just um, photonic crystal. There's another uh, subject that is broadly uh, studied in my group. It's a subject of superhydrophobicity. And I'm bringing now another biological system, and there is a reason I want to show that. So everybody knows about superhydrophobicity of lotus leaf. Everybody knows that if you have hydrophobic surface, which is in addition to that structured, then water on these surfaces would stay in what is called Cassie wetting, meaning that it's resting on a cushion of air. It's almost spherical shape, and therefore it's highly mobile. And this mobility is the biological mechanism that provides the self-cleaning property of these leaves. Why I'm mentioning it now, here's another biological system, butterflies. So it's another butterfly system I, uh, to, that I've shown today. And what I do want to show, oops, not that. Let's do it here. One of the ways nature evolve these morpho butterfly wings, one is to have color. Color is important. 
And this is structural color. Now, the other important feature is for this structural color not to go away if there is rain. Scales are extremely delicate. And if rain or water will infiltrate into the structure, the entire delicate structural color will, will collapse. So therefore, in addition to the ways nature evolved formation of, of structural color as its mechanism for survival, it also made sure that this structural color is super hydrophobic. So droplets of water is actually jump off the surface and therefore structural color remains as is. But what would happen if, um, in fact, there would be wetting? So let's take a look at the entire morpho butterfly. We did see what happens with water. But if you drop alcohol on it, nature doesn't give us the pleasure of alcohol rain, so nature didn't need to develop a strategy how to solve or how to uh, resist uh, infiltration of this liquid. But you could see that alcohol is actually infiltrating the structure, and the moment it infiltrates the structure, the color changes. In this case, the green color that is appearing is not structural at all. It's coming from a pigment on the other side of the butterfly um, wing. Let me show you another uh, system that we studied a long time ago in my group. It's actually still in Bell Labs. It's brittle stars. So brittle stars are echinoderms, and one type of them has these incredible lenses as part of its skeleton. It feels kind of irrelevant to what I'm talking about. By the way, it's still optics. It's not structural color. But what this, um, the butterflies have developed, they developed the way of bringing a layer of black pigment to cover the lenses during the day, creating really effective sunglasses for the organism and withdrawing the pigment during the night. In this way, the optical properties of, these, of this system are highly regulated and they really put on um, sunglasses to protect their system from excessive light and then to see better when during night the light is not as, um, is, where it's not enough light. So let's think about what we often do in my lab, taking lessons from completely different organisms and think how these together may help us in questions that we want to ask. For example, what if we will take the strategy of inverse opals that exist in, let's say, butterfly wings, and we now know how to make these uh, biological analysis synthetically, but we will take advantage of liquids that may infiltrate. When they infiltrate, we do know structural color is supposed to uh, disappear or not to infiltrate. In other words, <clears throat> Let's think about this approach. We call it WIC, as I mentioned, or W Inc. It's wetting in color kit, and the design principles, in short, are the following. I've shown to you how we can make these porous, highly um, interconnected structure with perfectly controlled sizes of each pore, no cracks. But now, as chemists, we can do something beyond physics and beyond optical properties. Of course, we can now functionalize this surface with different chemistries, and in particular, let's say, chemistries of different hydrophobicities. So we can have, um, if this is, let's say, um, glass, SiO2, we can use different silanes with different uh, hydrophobic properties to functionalize the surface. Now, we can functionalize it it also in different locations, not entire structure. We can use plasma matching and a stent mask so that certain region, regions would carry one chemical, other regions would carry another chemical, so you can pattern your chemistry onto your photonic crystal. 
When it's dry, you wouldn't even know this chemistry is there. But then, and I hope this movie works, where you will <clears throat> have chemistry present, the regions where this beautiful structural color will disappear is where water will come in. And in this case, since I study a lot of marine organisms, here is a very easy example to show you how this approach would work. You use a liquid, it infiltrates certain regions. The regions that are being infiltrated, the um, contrast in these regions now between air, air is gone, now almost zero, therefore you don't see color anymore, and in this way, you can have a dynamic optical system that gives you response, like an analytical response, to the type of chemicals that you are testing. So, what happens then is, let's talk about it as much as I love chemistry, we need to understand that the quality of this film, and in particular, the very interesting geometry of the porous network is a critical component to bring sensitivity to this system. In particular, if I look at the porous network, even if I would functionalize it with the molecule, let's say hydro, make it hydrophilic, meaning that water is supposed to have a lower than 90 degrees contact angle, and it's supposed to wet the surface, but no, it's not going to do it because of this inverse structure, these points, and the necking point in your structure create a pinning size for water. So, <clears throat> in fact, contact angles are supposed to change their sign from plus to minus to infiltrate the pore. So this well, this energy well, will only let the liquids whose neck angle that is shown here, phi zero, is larger than the contact angle of this liquid. If <clears throat> the necking angle is smaller, even though this liquid wets the surface, it will not infiltrate the structure. This gives you extremely high selectivity of this approach. The outcome of that, and here is one example, is that you can put different chemistries in different regions. You can have this multi-layer encryption into the structure, and this is an example using um, different percent of ethanol. You will reveal different messages because depending on concentration, you will have different contact angle, and this different contact angle will allow you to infiltrate certain regions, but not others. All the regions that are being infiltrated lose their color, and only regions that where liquid didn't go through would still keep the structural color. You can do it in many different ways. Um, there's a couple of examples where you have this pattern surface chemistry. I'll go further. But you can do many different tricks. For example, you can have the same chemistry or homogeneous mixture of different chemistries. Or you can take adv uh, advantage of the fact that I can partially etch the structure and then infiltrate it or functionalize it with a second chemical. And in this way, you will have a gradient of, let's say, hydrophobicity or some other properties across your sample. The outcome of that is depending how many layers of your structure the liquid would fill. If it fills very little, you will have a lot of unfilled regions, and the color that you will see also will be different. In this way, you can actually have versatile wetting-based indicators for alcohols, for common clean room solvents, for fuel grades. This is kind of an interesting example. Going from C6 to C10, you can simply count the number of teeth 
that are still preserved with structural color to tell which, um, which material this is. There is a problem, of course, because here's an example, methanol and octane will give you exactly the same outcome. But then, who said it has to be just one um, indicator? If you would have an array of indicators, and in this case, I just showed two. Simply two arrays for the same system. This is methanol, this is octane, and depending on the gradient that I use in my system, one of them would be much more wetting in that array and less wetting here, while octane would be more wetting here, but not there. And this combinatorial approach gives you precise definition of the liquid that you are testing. Of course, we can go in the principal component analysis and see that you really can identify liquids um, simply by the way with the optical response of these structures. You can do more. So far, it was functionalizing it just to change surface tension, but you don't have to do that only. Let's say you want to think about anti-tempering. And it's important for your material not to be exposed to sunlight. One can functionalize it with photodegradable dye, let's say polyelectrolyte uh, uh, that I show here in this particular case, and then wetting threshold would indicate amount of prior light exposure. Because how much, what is the dose of light that it will um, have, we can read this out from the indicator that would have different levels of structural color remaining in the system. You can also think about applications in medical areas. There's two examples that I show here. We were looking at these inverse opal films for medical sensing, in particular, in diagnosis of neonatal jaundice. So many babies are being born with jaundice. Which level of jaundice is it? Is it something that will go away and we shouldn't pay attention to it, or it's a medical condition that requires um, serious attention? Jaundice is generally associated with an increase in bile salt concentration. Bile salt changes surface tension of, um, of urine. And therefore, just using these sensors and seeing that at the concentration of a bile salt, that is medically relevant at the level where medical attention should be present, we can identify and the cases that would have and simply do it by using urine. This is another uh, approach where we were looking into uh, field-ready ethanol indicators or even day drug, uh, um, rape drug uh, situations. Can we have glass stirs or even glasses and depending on how much structural color survives, gives you information on concentration of alcohol in your system or other materials that you want to, de uh, to detect. There are many other things that we can do. Mm, I may skip that one. Because indeed, you can use it for encryption, liquid detection, authentication, anti-tempering. But just a little bit more interesting things uh, in collaboration with the Harvard School of Design, if you have bathroom tiles, you take a shower um, and patterns begin to appear um, while it is wet outside. It dries out, no, uh, no color remains, and in connection to yesterday's or day before, uh, St. Patrick's Day, we have a lot of these drinking games. This is a chess set that you will know which piece this is only if you put specific uh, liquid inside and the uh, words that would appear will tell you um, what kind of uh, 
messages of different kinds depending which liquid you put inside. But let me try to go to more important probably application. At least back then, and it was in 2014, and you will see now it's again relevant this year, I was uh, contacted by Department of Transportation. And the reason is that crude oil transportation became a serious issue because in 2010, almost nothing was transported by rail. In 2014, when they contacted me, huge volumes of crude oil was transported now by trains. And the outcome of that, okay, I don't know whether it will play. We've seen a lot of them. What it's saying is about explosion of these trains. There are many of them, and they all explode. Uh, let me see, it's supposed to show what happens back then, and we know that similar thing just happened um, now about a month ago. So what happened back then is there was a lot of discussion of how should we consider uh, how to move by rail dangerous materials, in particular, in this particular case, uh, crude oil. And how can we change the type of tanks, but even more importantly, can we have a more accurate classification of unrefined petroleum-based products? Now, petroleum-based products, uh, crude oil, is a really complex mixture of things. So what can be done to understand whether crude oil packaging groups should be BP with a boiling point below 35, which is the most flammable? So how to deal with that if you actually don't have enough time to test your liquid in the field? So our approach was is development of user-friendly, low-cost diagnostic device that actually you can take a picture of this wetting pattern in the system, and looking at this wetting pattern will tell you packaging group one, two, three, or what are the properties of this material so that the proper uh, conditions and the proper tanks would be used for their uh, transportation. We actually started a company that is called Balidera Technologies, uh, which is actually now looking at broadly in how to validate and control emissions in a whole range of industries. But it's originally started with this idea of, as you could see here, depending which liquids you use, you will have completely different messages appearing. Let's stay with this important problem. But let's think about a different approach. Let's forget wetting in color approach. We will still need photonics. But I would like now to talk about order detection. And in this case, yes, we just talked about derailments and spills. Very nice place where order uh, would be nice to be able to recognize volatile molecules, house fires, so it's a range of industries and applications that we should consider. More and more appearing even in medical areas where every year, pretty much, there are more and more signatures of certain diseases that are associated with volatile organic compounds that are being um, exhaled at the very early uh, offsets of the disease. Now, Let's look at this this way. And I want to start with a really simple picture. We all know, nothing new there, that animal sniffing is adaptive, targeted, fast. What I want to show again, as much as majority of us think I did too, that chemical sensors for um, electronic nose, it's all about chemistry. However, it's probably even more than that, a problem of fluid dynamics. It's a problem of aerodynamics. Because I hope you all pay attention 
that you, even without thinking about it, we sniff differently. And the perception of the same compound, depending on whether we take a deep sniff or a set of small sniffs, will give you completely different information. So this smell and how um, the structure of your nostrils and the strengths of inhale-exhale approach is something that we need to think about, not just chemical sensing. I can, would like to go to structural color again, and this is a beautiful um, limpet, the bio another biological system that we studied in my group. These blue ray limpet, these blue rays on its surface is structural color. This is calcium carbonate shell, but it arranges right here in this region. It makes a photonic multilayer, and photonic multilayer with specific features, so it's structural color, the distance between these layers gives you strong reflection in blue. So you actually see this color very well, even though it's made out of transparent calcium carbonate material. So what I will try to do, take some lessons from olfactory systems, but I will take advantage of photonic multilayers in the following way. Let's talk about two approaches. One is passive sensing and then dynamic sensing. Please, it's a little bit confusing when I was putting it together. Even the word passive is confusing here. In both cases, I will talk about dynamic non-equilibrium detection modes. What I mean by that, as opposed to chemical sensors that generally define now, where you look at the baseline and that take a measurement of uh, the interaction at equilibrium with the molecules that you want to study, there is before and after. What we are trying to do is actually have a system where fluid dynamics plays an extremely important role. So the vapor, so liquid is introduced, it has a feature of spreading, then evaporation, then diffusion and convection. Then as, as it reaches photonic bilayer that is very similar to the one that I've shown you in biological system, now adsorption and even more interestingly, desorption from this photonic bilayer will give you some information. But it's not one point. It's not equilibrium information. What we are trying to look at is spectrometer data as a function of time. So we are recording the evolution of the spectral data as your um, volatile compi uh, compound reaches the receptors, stays absorbed, then desorbs, and in this way, information is extremely interesting. The other one that I will may have still time to discuss is active sensing. And active sensing is using sequences of inhale, exhale um, procedures to understand the uh, properties. What is really important is that we use, and the most interesting things come from machine learning in these systems. So we're looking at this, what is called river plot, it changes in time of the wavelengths of, of this photonic uh, sensor. We then look how this wavelength changes. We then take the derivative of this, and this feature, in fact, gives you very rich information about even chemicals that have absolutely similar or impossible to distinguish information if you take just one point uh, equilibrium m uh, measurement. So uh, just an example. Look at this variety of different um, molecules they will have completely different support vector machine that is trained on them, and here is 88% prediction accuracy for, the, for this approach. You can do more than that. You can actually look at mixtures. Mixtures are often a big problem in analytical chemistry, but here, having mixtures, let's, let's take a look at pentane-octane mixture with R squared of 
0.98, you can tell what is the mixture and what is the um, concentration in this mixture. You can do even more than that. You can actually train <clears throat> your system and use it for prediction of physical properties. You can predict pre uh, physical properties of, let's say it's trained on alkane, you can predict an unknown alkane or unknown mixture of alkane, and we can predict with R squared larger than 95 actual boiling point, actual flash point, viscosity, or vapor pressure in the system. Even more interestingly, you can actually train it on alkanes, but have an unknown, not part of this tra training set, toluene in this case, and predict pretty well uh, properties, well, three of them were predicted pretty well, uh, with, with a problem with actual vapor pressure, because it's a completely different compound. But one can have boiling point, flash point, and viscosity based on training on a completely different set of chemical. And let me finish with just touching upon a little bit on this active sensing. And I truly believe there is a lot that we can and will be doing using this idea of active sensing. For example, if I would look at not just, it, it's also dynamic data. We also look at data as it changes over time. But then, let's say we have five short inhale events before exhale event. As I said, notice that if you don't know exactly what you are sniffing, automatically almost, we are taking multiple sniffs, very short multiple sniffs. Very rarely we would take deep sniff if, in these cases, somehow three and five is a very common feature for us to take short sniffs to understand what is out there, is it dangerous or not. So it's exactly what is being done in, in this case. You uptake the volatile organic compound in the form of sniffs. You can control sequence of inhale, wait, before having another um, inhale, volume of this time that you inhale, then how much time you spend to exhale um, the uh, volume uh, that you introduced. This gives, and this is where a lot of interesting features, a much better uh, resolution comes in, is in fact, by doing this, you can resolve a lot of absorption, desorption, and diffusion characteristics in your system. And now, because it's active sniffing, something that was resolved in a couple of minutes, sometimes up to 10 minutes in the previous approach, within seconds, it can give you high, um, high resolution of this approach. There is another thing to think about. Yeah, we tried just two and shown that whether it's a deep sniff or short sniffs, it gives you completely different information, but complementary information. In some cases, you may actually need to have yet another sniffing sequence to resolve uh, the feature that would complete, have completely different outcome. So simply by changing uh, this approach of inhale, wait, and e exhale sequence, you can now um, amplify features that you want. And for example, now with using short sniff and long exhale, you can um, really uh, determine ethanol while you will have everything else and other sequences may not work as well. So I do believe that this approach of sniffing and dynamic patterns can give you the way of recognizing volatile organic compounds with very high uh, resolution and in particular taking advantage of um, analysis of data using machine learning. But I've shown it with photonic sensor, but it doesn't have to be that. In principle, that approach of dynamic sensor 
that takes um, data over time and how absorption, desorption, diffusion changes as a function of sniffing sequ sequences or time can be coupled with other sensors. The other sensors could be electronic sensors or chemical sensors that are being put as single or arrays or multivariable sensors and together produce this extremely rich information about the um, materials that you use, about their mixtures, about unknown physical properties that you can predict using, um, using this approach. And hopefully, these two dynamic and biologically inspired in many ways approaches are somewhat new and will be used one day, hopefully, in many areas. So what I would like to do now, of course, is to thank students, postdocs. I only list here those who were specifically involved in the work that I described today. Um, it's a lot of students. They're so wonderful. I mean, this is their work. It's not as much my work. And of course, postdocs, collaborators coming from different areas. And this is yet another thing that is so critical. Uh, as a chemist, I still would say most interesting things bear fruit when there is collaboration with completely different um, sciences and different points of view are brought together. For example, Mark Lonkar is an electrical engineer, Chris Barrett is chemist, Dave Ways is a chemical engineer, then Kim Murphy is studying olfactory system, My Michael Brenner is applied mathematicians interested in machine learning. But of course, I would like to thank uh, various funding agencies. This is Department of Transportation. Maybe they need to talk to us again at this point, but a lot of interesting biological features, or at least biological optics, uh, started as part of uh, Air Force MURI, and I would like to thank Department of Energy and Office of Naval Research for studying biological deep-sea creatures, and obviously I want to thank you for your attention.